So yeah, hi, and great um, presentation, Rebecca. So my name is Glenn Anderson, and I'm um, one of the landowners on the Wendling Beck Environment Project. So it's a collaborative um, land use change project just north of Durham in Norfolk. Um, and I'm just going to kind of run you through that and explain a little bit about what we're doing and why we're doing it and um, where we hope to get to in the future. So the project um, is kind of slap bang in the middle of Norfolk. So the, the map on the right hand side is a is a map of Norfolk. You can see where I, I think the, the true centre of Norfolk is a, is marked by a stone, which is actually in the project area. Um, and the map on the left hand side is, is actually a map of Breckland. And that actually shows the kind of the strategic green infrastructure corridors within Breckland and they tend to follow the river valleys. So the, the Wendling Beck um, is actually the name of a stream which runs through the project area south to north um, and it's a tributary to the Wensum, so Chalk Stream. I'm not sure if, if people are aware but Chalk Streams are an extremely rare habitat type, so there's only about 200 in the world, 85% of those are actually in the UK and a lot of those are in Norfolk and I think the River Wensum is, is probably one of the, the best examples of a, of a Chalk Stream network anywhere in the world. And the dark red lines on here are also the, the Norfolk trails. So this is the Pedders Way. We have the Nar Valley Way, which runs from Kings Lynn, um, and the uh, Wensum Way, which actually runs from Norwich. And they actually converge within the project area, which is in the dotted line. And we have just created a new Norfolk trail called the Wending Way, named after the project, which actually is quite a short trail, but actually connects um, Deerham Town Centre to these other um, trails as well. So who are we? Um, I'll, I'll skip through this quite quickly, but you can see that it's quite a big collaboration of, of different landowners and um, various different organizations. Um, there's four farmer landowners involved in this. We also have Norfolk Wildlife Trust and Norfolk County Council who have smaller land holdings, but are really important to the project for, for various reasons, which I'll come on to. And we're actually supported by the Nature Conservancy at a, an international level. So they're a big American NGO, um, about $1.5 billion a year of um, philanthropic do donations through mainly high net worth individuals in the US. But they have a principal mission in, in life, which is to, is to preserve all of the land and water upon which life exists. So they're experts in... Um, you know, um, working with projects to, to find practical and pragmatic sort of solutions um, to, to leverage in finance and um, create what we call nature-based solutions. We then have um, Norfolk Rivers Trust and Norfolk FWAG at kind of a, a local level. And actually, <coughs> um, Anglian Water are also a part of this collaboration. So again, as we're, as we're looking at how we deliver this, working with... Um, organizations that have their fair share of issues and have their fair share of um, responsibility on river systems and ecosystems. Um, our view is that we need to, to kind of embrace that and work with these organizations to, to see how they can do things better and, and use nature as, as solutions for, um, for a lot of the, the problems that they're experiencing as well. So we're, we're working at sort of multiple levels. And then there's a whole team of kind of support partners, the University of East Anglia, um, extremely important. We end up talking to lots of lawyers and ecologists and, um, you know, organizations that you wouldn't typically think of um, as we're trying to deliver a, a kind of a complex project like this. So why on earth are we doing this? Um, I ask myself that question quite often. Um, really, we see as farmers, we're out in the in you know on in the landscape all the time, and, and we really believe that um, climate change is actually the single biggest threat to food security. We we hear quite a lot about um, food security at the moment. We've also got a cost of living crisis. Um, but really, since the 1950s, we've seen an, an intensification of um, agriculture, which has had a huge impact on the, um, the sort of the natural ecosystems and the environment which we we live and breathe. And we just don't believe that's sustainable anymore. So we, we know from the, the processes that we've gone through within conventional farming that, um, you know, we we 
apply quite a lot of um, agrochemicals and synthetic fertilizers which are generally working against nature and it's it's hard work to be honest so we we want to be able to work with nature um, and look at um, different ways of doing things and different models which will put more balance back into the system we obviously have lots of issues with water quality both from a, um, a you know a quality from a nutrient perspective but also from a security um, perspective as well so as we as climate change has more and more impact and we saw a, we obviously had a huge drought last year we've had quite a wet spring but it looks like we're now heading into another drought you know these these patterns of extremes are impossible for farming so we really need to redress that balance um, in as, as urgently as possible um, and find ways of doing things differently and working with the soils and the water um, to to make it a more sustainable process the land that we're on here is very very light so that means that we suffer badly from from drought particularly um, but it's also not the most productive land so what can we do differently you know as we we hear quite a lot around um, this concept of in, intensification of production to, to bring down food prices, that's not our view. We really feel that actually we need to, to look at the root causes of this and, and redress that balance um, uh, and really, um, you know, look at different ways of doing things. And we had, we've, we've sort of had a subsidy regime over the years, which has caused its fair share of issues on the environment as well, seeking, um, you know, more and more kind of uh, higher yields and not really looking at the bottom line with ag chem companies and, and supermarkets and various other elements of the supply, supply chain, you know, making the best out of that and farmers always being squeezed at the bottom. And, and we've certainly experienced that. I think somebody the other day used the expression that the farmers were being farmed, which I thought was, was quite apt. Um, we're now out of Europe, so the, the cap and the subsidy regime is phasing out, and that's part of the driver for this project. We see subsidies as that um, sort of mechanism that underwrites the risk of production. We need to look at doing things differently, and I, I personally believe that subsidies going will see a, a big change in the way that we think and use land um, and, and have, a, have a positive impact on the environment. We also have the concept of, of kind of agri-environment agreements. So over the years, it's been kind of stewardship. We're now moving into to, um, environmental land management. Um, it's the new scheme that's being brought forward by the government. And historically, we felt that, that hasn't been sort of strategic enough. It hasn't really connected big areas of, of habitat. As Rebecca was saying, that kind of nature really thrives at scale. We've got these laws and principles which goes back to the making space for nature report in 2010 where we know that nature really thrives at scale you need a, a kind of a complex mosaic of habitats at, at a certain size to, to make that effective and that you don't really get that with the historic agri-environment agreements there are new um, strategies coming forward as part of um, things like landscape recovery which could redress that balance but um, certainly, historically, it's been quite frustrating. We've always seen agri-environments been at sort of farmer convenience that you take a field corner and maybe put it into some flowers or some bird food, but you're not really thinking about the, the sort of strategic benefit for nature within that process. So that's what we want to try and do now. We also have to redress that net zero challenge. The NFU have committed to net to be net zero by 2040. You know, we, we've done a carbon audit we know that that's not going to happen without fundamentally reinventing that production model so that was where the kind of the, the thinking started on this as well how do we how do we get this carbon footprint back in check how do we you know make that more efficient and and what can we do to sequester and store carbon with the land that we have as well and then we have some new opportunities within um what we call private markets so you know companies investing in things like carbon um, reversal of biodiversity loss um natural flood management schemes where we you know we've seen an increase in development where we we get a much quicker runoff the soils are not storing water like they used to um th partly through intensification of agriculture as well so what can we do to to try and fund some of these new ways of thinking and these kind of um wilder landscapes if you will 
We want to continue the story of food production, but in a much more sustainable way. So within the Wendlin Beck, um, we will keep um, a black currant um, operation, which actually grows um, currants for Ribena, but they're moving into a regenerative system. So the principle of regenerative agriculture is where you're you're losing the agrochemicals and synthetic inputs and, and working with the sort of natural processes of the soil, um, using the soil to hold onto water for longer, working with the kind of the, the microbiology of the soil to get the bacteria working again because we've we've inadvertently killed most of that through um, the way that we farmed it over the past sort of hundred years. And um, we think that we can do this and still get a return on investment. So we've got a lot of um, capital turned tied up in the land. Um, we need to, to try and get a, a return on that and we're also pragmatic that if we can create a model that we think other people will want to deliver then that will drive scale and replication and that will really start to tackle the big picture and government have its has its own targets so the 25 year environment plan um, goes back to 2018 that was really a um, you know the key the key target of um, working towards the reversal of climate change and biodiversity loss but we've delivered very little on that to date um, we're hoping that these these sort of new mechanisms really ramp that up now and 30 by 30 so again Rebecca mentioned this this concept of um, you know um, renaturalizing 30 percent of of land and water by 2030 so how do we hit those targets how do we make that possible and how do we get you know, big landowners and small landowners alike to, to kind of try and sign up to these policies. So very quickly, Wendling Beck today um, is pretty much an arable landscape with the, the Wendling Beck River running through the middle, which tends to give us this kind of green corridor. We have Anglin Waters Water Recycling Centre in the bottom, which take in the sewage effluent from Deerham. So there's about 26,000 people going into there. Um, and the, the map in the top left hand corner is a UK have map shows the orange is is kind of intensive arable production. And over time, we want to make this a much more natural, um, wilder landscape. Um, and you can see that the different sort of habitat mosaics in here, it becomes much more grass based. Um, we will need more livestock to manage that um, grass. We'd look into have a sort of a farm shop and cafe. Um, to continue that, that process of food production within that footprint, but at a much more sustainable level. So high welfare, low density, um, managing things like lowland meadows. So the UK has lost 99% of its lowland meadows since the um, sort of 1940s and 50s, since the war really. And I think actually Wendling, when we looked at it, moved the dial um, a little bit on the amount of Lola Meadow just on its own, which tells its own story about just how little um, Lola Meadow there is uh, left in the country, but also different habitats. So lowland heath, um, floodplain wetland mosaic, connective um, woodland corridors. This is slightly different from, uh, from the kind of the purest view of rewilding. So it's not completely non-intervention. Um, it is looking at actually accelerating natural processes in part. So we, we're doing things like introducing um, wildflower mixes in places, and that's simply because they're not there anymore. They've they've been, you know, they've gone from years of um, plowing and chemical application. That seed bank has just been lost. So we, we do need to intervene in places. As Rebecca said, we don't we don't have um, apex predators, so we need to kind of move livestock around the landscape to manage that in different ways. Um, it's a kind of a, a gentle managed um, pseudo rewilding project, if you will. There's other elements within here that are important. So the, the big stripe that runs uh, left to right here is it's about four kilometers across the project area is actually a, a, an offshore um, wind farm cable. When that comes through, we will leave the, the fencing in situ. We're actually upgrading the fencing to chestnut. We'll plant hedges down either side, which over time we'll let tumble out. And it becomes a big 50 meter wide green corridor, a droving road to move livestock across and a connective corridor for um, everything from birds and bats and insects and invertebrates and everything else. 
Um, we're also restoring an old parkland where there used to be a, a stately home with a big um, shelter belt. So again, trying to look at the history of the landscape and, and restore the kind of the, the high distinctiveness um, habitats and assets that were in there. There's also a, a museum site within the project, which is owned by Norfolk County Council, which is looking at telling the story of the sort of history of um, farming and rural life in Norfolk. We will we will give them the additionality to start to tell the story of the future of farming and conservation. We're putting a couple of bridges over the the Wendenbeck River, which will allow them to connect to the project area physically. There's a there's a new cycle path that's gone in from um, Durham Marketplace that links to the museum site, which is is sort of helping people. Um, get more access into the, the the project area and the countryside but also all ability access so we're now seeing that you know that went in a few months ago we're now seeing wheelchair users able to to use this we've been working on a monument project around helping people living with dementia to access nature and the the sort of um, social prescribing and physical well-being of of that within there um, there's lots of other things in here. We're looking at a, a disease resistant um, ash and elm nursery, working with John Innes Centre in Norwich to create a seed bank of, of disease resistant seed by about 2030. Um, we're actually looking at a species recovery for a, a really rare liverwort, which exists on the edge of the project area where we're doing a translocation to the to the project area because it's the only place in the world that it exists and it will go extinct um, if we don't do something now. So these are kind of slightly interventionist processes, but we're we're, we're sort of the eternal pragmatists within this. So we're, we're using whatever um, tools are at our disposal. And we sort of see ourselves as ecosystem engineers, but equally there are opportunities for nature to do that for itself. So within these cars here, it's amazing kind of wetland. If you go on the website, there's some video of it. You know, we would like to reintroduce beavers into those into those sites. They will um, allow light into the understory. They'll also start to desilt some of the lakes um, through the way that they engineer the lodges using natural processes. We've now got some some real cornerstone species appearing in here only after sort of eighteen months of doing the project, and we don't want to go in there with sort of chainsaws and things like that. So the beavers would do that that kind of natural process for us. And again, the concept map just shows you that in a in a bit more detail. Um, there's a bird hide um, going into the um, into this sort of triple SI area here. Climate resistant arboretum. Looking at um, how we can use different species of trees to enhance resilience within the landscape. So maybe using native species and taking seed from Mediterranean climates because. Although we're doing this now, it's got to um, be delivered in perpetuity. So how do we um, slightly engineer some of those processes to, to stand the, the tests of climate change and everything else that goes with it? The project area is, is a couple of thousand acres. Um, you know, that, in our view, is, is arguably landscape scale. Um, it's delivering multiple habitat types and a, and a kind of a dynamic mosaic within it. Um, we're working with sort of multiple um, organizations and collaborating with other farmers, other landowners, neighbors, um, looking at how we can help other projects as well. So we're working on um, four or five other projects uh, across a wider area now covering about 300,000 acres, um, just using this knowledge and passing on some of the some of the thinking to try and really grow and replicate the scale of this. Um, you know, we believe, as, as Alicia sort of alluded to, that a lot of these um, existing supply chains are broken. Um, we really need to redress the balance within that um, to try and um, get us back into a system where we're growing healthy food with high nutrient density so people don't need to eat so much and can get out in nature and enjoy it and, and um feel the kind of the physical physical and mental well-being sort of impacts of that as well. So we have delivered about 160, 170 acres on the ground, about seven different habitat types out of the 2000. Um, we're, we're creating um, sort of multiple um, mechanisms around how we can finance that through that process as well. Um, but yeah, there's there's some videos on the website. I'll stop there because I think I'm probably over time. Um, so have a have a look at it and um, have a look at the film on there as well. 
That was great, and it, worth every second. <laughs> don't, don't worry about the timing. Fantastic and inspiring, and the detail was absolutely excellent and really helpful for helping us understand how possible some of these changes are. Thank you so much. And lastly, I'd like to invite Louise Reddy from uh, Surfers Against Sewage um, to talk to us about the work you're doing.